Friends, uh, welcome to church. It's great to see you here. Um, welcome also if you're watching us on YouTube. And if you joined us this morning because the Rugby League Grand Final is on tonight, John, welcome. <laughs> yes. we, we're aware of your little tricks. It is brilliant, isn't it, to meet together and also to reflect on God's kindness and mercy. Uh, all creatures of our God and King, that uh, famous him by St. Francis Assisi, uh, reminds us that Jesus uh, came to redeem the whole creation. And that'll be the theme of our sermon series uh, toward the end of the term and through Christmas into early January, uh, the redemption of all creation. Uh, Jesus' work on the cross uh, can fix uh, everything, and we're so glad of that. Well, friends, um, we're also glad that the, uh, this work of Jesus is a work that uh, brings forgiveness. The Apostle John writes, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and he will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Uh, Steph's going to encourage us from Ecclesiastes today to search our hearts and to be honest about uh, who we are and where we stand uh, with our God and our Creator. So let's spend a few moments in reflection and then we'll pray a confession prayer together. Let's pray this prayer of confession. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we humbly admit that we need your help. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have failed to do. You alone can save us. Have mercy on us, wipe out our sins, and teach us to forgive others. Strengthen us to serve you and to live our lives to your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Apostle John continues, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And that news, that gospel news of the grace of God shown in the Lord Jesus, we are committed to sharing with uh, our world and uh, our community. And that's a great privilege. Well, I want to say very strongly today that uh, Christian people don't just believe any old thing. We believe rather very specific things about who God is, about what he's done for us, especially what he's done for us in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus. Uh, and a great summary of that belief uh, is found in the historic creeds of the uh, church, and one of those is the Apostles' Creed. I wonder if you'd stand with me now as we encourage one another in this foundational set of truths. 
We say together, We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the cross he descended into hell. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is now seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Apostolic Church, the fellowship of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life eternal. Amen. Uh, well said. Please have a seat. Well, the living God is a God who speaks, and we're going to hear the living God speak to us now from the Scriptures. Uh, Adrian is going to read to us from Luke chapter 10. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, the reading today is taken from the book of Luke, uh, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to the test to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be, going, to be uh, going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to, pl to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man? who fell into the hands of the robbers. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, a number of us teaching um, scripture, SRE in schools were teaching that parable to uh, the kids in our classes. And it's a very powerful story, isn't it? And it's very interesting, Jesus' choice of the hero in that story. We call it the, uh, the story of the good stranger. And uh, it was a lot of fun. Well, our friends at um, Emu Music have got a new album out. We're very uh, thankful to our Emu Music uh, brothers and sisters. And uh, we commend their work to you. Go on their website. You can buy uh, this music if you wish. It's a great song. It's called Alleluia. We're going to listen to it now.
Let us pray. Lord of heaven, we give you thanks and praise for your gift of hope in the struggles of human life. We give you thanks for the enduring record of this hope through your word and for the many witnesses to the power of your name throughout the ages. We thank you for your merciful grace which can lift us beyond our human limitation and open our hearts and minds to the hope and blessings of a real relationship with you. So we can call out to you and you answer and give us what we really lack and need in wisdom and healing. Lord, we thank you for our beautiful land, our beautiful planet and life-sustaining planet which seems uniquely equipped in contrast to those other planets that seem so empty, the ones that we've been able to reach through our scientific space exploration. We wonder at our creation and the undeserved, overwhelming gift of a personal saviour, offering us presence at your table as his adopted children. A shepherd, teacher, model, who walks beside us through our days on earth, encouraging, enabling and empowering us through his Holy Spirit, Lord, here in New South Wales, Australia, we thank you at this time for the apparent relief from new COVID infections when the rest of the world seems to be suffering greater losses of ongoing uh, loss of life and hope. We thank you that expat Australians are at last able to come home to family and seeming safety. We pray for our missionaries returning home with their goals and work incomplete in their minds and who have concerns for they have left behind. We pray for those new believers facing huge challenges to their faith and even safety. We pray for your saving grace in our missionaries' own struggles as they adjust to different challenges at home and we ask that you continue to bless them and those that come close to them. Lord, we ask for forgiveness for our pride, our hubris as a nation, ignore and slip away from worship or acknowledging, acknowledging you as the Lord of heaven and earth, creator and judge. And we pray that this worldwide COVID pandemic experience with its loss of life and its merciless increase will be a wake-up call to many who may turn and acknowledge that they need not be alone in these sort of struggles. Lord, we pray for your wisdom in our own choices and our relationships with each other, our planet and our Creator. Lord, we thank you for your willing servants here at St Anne's who have battled on through COVID to keep us close to you despite lockdowns and restrictions, so that your word and comfort continue to bring hope to our needy society. We thank you for those with skills in technology who have enabled your word to go out where it heals and teaches. We pray for, for our effective outreach in scripture classes, in our Sunday services, programs, through race and wherever your word is taught. We thank you that you did send rain and relief from bushfire and drought and our farmers are now able to harvest their crops with new hope despite what they experienced last year and we pray for their continuing protection. We pray for the work of foreign aid that's done through Christian organisations throughout the world, helping those in need, in prison, under persecution or simply having their environments being destroyed by corporate greed. We pray for women and children who are usually preyed upon and enslaved. We pray that the, we pray that the gifts for Tear Fund reach those who will most benefit 
and more people will seek to learn more of you and find rest and refuge in you. Thank you for our church, its leadership and our fellowship and its ongoing biblical thirst. We thank you for your ongoing provision of people and property and place and our continuing dependence on your mercy and shelter as we shelter under your wings, as we have learnt to hope. And we ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we might pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Anyway, um, let's continue with our announcements. Um, and I forgot to introduce myself at the start. My name's Greg Burke. For those on the um, YouTube watching us, it's great to see you, and uh, thanks for joining us. Um, so my wife found this a uh, little bit of wisdom. We're looking at wisdom, Emil Zola. We are like books. Most people only see our cover. The minority read only the introduction. Many people believe the critics. Few will know our content. That's quite... Helpful, actually. Quite thought-provoking. Uh, Tier Fund Australia. Uh, we're, each year we support this uh, great organisation through a useful gift shop. And at the back, the catalogues are there. If you've not got one in order form, you can fill that in and get it back to us. If you're writing cheques, uh, some people still write cheques. Uh, hard to believe, but they do. And if you're writing a cheque, please make the cheque out to St Anne's, not to Tier Fund, because it needs to go through our accounts. That's how we get the money, to Tier and that makes it a lot simpler. So if you could do that, that'd be great. Now, last week, lots of people supported these cute shopkeepers. And uh, you helped them to raise, or we raised together, $200 for their... That, that's great. Let's thank our kids. Um, it's such an important part of uh, teaching and discipling children to help them to understand that uh, God wants us to be generous givers, uh, so much of our world is saying get, 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 and especially with kids, it's a, that's a hard lesson to learn. Um, those of us who are adults, it's hard for us to learn too, but we pretend better than they do. Uh, for them, it's out the front. But So it's great to be able to do that and help them to support Tia, and thank you for your support. Uh, offering, um, our parish council met on Monday night and they passed a motion, which uh, I put in the covering uh, email for our newsletter, uh, basically thanking you, thanking all the members of our congregation for your continued financial support of our church. Uh, that has been a great encouragement to Parish Council and the Wardens, and we really want to say thank you. Uh, you might pray for our Parish Council and Wardens as we uh, prayerfully consider our budget constraints for next year, because there's been, we are anticipating, a significant reduction in our property income, and we have to work out how to respond to that. So uh, please pray about that. If you're visiting today, we've got a welcome pack there. The ushers can give you that. Uh, next week, uh, in this festival, The Boot, this looks a little bit like a uh, football score, doesn't it? Uh, living dogs beat dead lions. But um, I don't think uh, dogs and lions, well, there, there are lions around, I guess, but uh, it's not. It's actually the title of our sermon from Ecclesiastes chapter 9, uh, verses 1 to 12. Uh, Bruce will be teaching that passage. We're getting to the end of this series now. And uh, it's been a great series. It's been a series asking us to take a reality check. And it's good to ground our faith in reality. I'm going to read from Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 1 through to verse 20. A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Frustration is better than laughter, because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, 
but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. Extortion turns a wise person into a fool, and a bribe corrupts the heart. The end of a matter is better than its beginning, and patience is better than pride. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. Wisdom is like an inheritance, is a good thing, and benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter, as money is a shelter, but the advantage of knowledge is this, wisdom preserves those who have it. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider this. God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, no one can discover anything about their future. In this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these. The righteous perishing in their righteousness, and the wicked living long in their wickedness. Do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over-wicked, and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. Wisdom makes one wise person more powerful than ten rulers in a city. Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. Well, before Steph teaches us from that passage, let's pray for a moment. Let's pray. Uh, God, our Father, we thank you that you are the true God who speaks. And we pray this morning that as we uh, look together at uh, your word, that you will help us, that you help us to listen and to hear what you say. Please change us by your spirit as he wields the sword of your word. And we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, uh, last week I found myself in the self-help section of a bookstore and what an interesting experience that was. Apparently in 30 days or less, I'm going to be more organized, I'll be eating healthily, I'll no longer have any anxiety. Seems almost too good to be true. You don't really realize how many self-help books there are until you're staring at a whole wall of them. And they're not just a secular thing, because you find them in Christian bookstores as well. Most of the time they're listed as Christian living. So as I was browsing the shelves, I found The Wisdom of Tea. Uh, it was the book that drew me in. I didn't read it, I have to confess, but I did have a little sneak peek of what it was about by checking out the contents page. Learn that you know nothing. Don't think with your head. Parting is inevitable. Listen to the voice within. Growth takes time. Those were a few of the chapter titles. Pretty standard pearls of wisdom. Nice little quotes and sayings to inspire you to live a wiser life. And we come across a lot of those nice little sayings. We had one of them in our announcements today. A picture is worth a thousand words. Dogs are man's best friends. We like to feel inspired. There is some part of us that needs that encouragement. Some of you might even have them framed on your wall. Be kind, be brave, always smile. Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and most of the book really, we come across lots of little proverbs of wisdom. As the teacher reflects back on his life, these are the things he has learnt. But I'm not sure we would be putting some of the things he says on our walls. I mean, verse 3 in chapter 7 probably wouldn't make it. Frustration is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. 
It's not really going to the pool room. So what is wisdom? If we pull out our handy little dictionaries, you'll find definitions that use words like knowledge, experience, good judgment. If you do a Google image search, you'll get pictures of books, brains, teeth, light bulbs, trees, cute little animals wearing glasses, and quotes. Lots of quotes. In Ecclesiastes, wisdom is a positive thing. The teacher, who's the main voice throughout the book, declares his wisdom right at the beginning. And in that wisdom, he's reflecting on life and he's sharing his views. For him, it is meaningless. It is ephemeral, puzzling, fleeting. He sees the sorrow and the pain that comes from living under the sun. What is the purpose of living? Why do we toil? Can we actually make sense of what we experience? These are some of the questions that we have to sit with. For him, he sees wisdom not in the pleasures of life, though you can find your satisfaction there. But if you choose to only chase pleasure, you become foolish. This is because you end up ignoring one of the main realities of life, the thing that most of us try to avoid, the reality of death. There's no escaping it. It's where we're all destined to be. As much as we try to avoid it, death happens. And if we do our best to shut it out of our thoughts, we're really missing a big piece of the puzzle of life. And that's where the teacher's wisdom in the first part of chapter seven is focused, this reality of life and death. It is better to face the reality of death and to acknowledge that we are finite beings. He says, it's better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting, for the death, for death is the destiny of everyone, and the living should take this to heart. When we ignore the reality of death, we lose sight of what life is really like. Some people, uh, they avoid funerals because it's just too hard for them to deal with the death of a loved one. But you'll find that the hardest part for some people, in fact, most people, is confronting their own end. How will people remember me? What will they say about my life? Do I have any regrets? I should have done this more. It's a sobering thought to have to reassess our lives. Is there anything that I've done that's worthwhile? You might be saying to yourself, I don't want to die yet. I still have so much to do. And these are all common and completely normal things to be thinking about. Because death puts life into perspective. And that's what the teacher is saying here. You truly see life when you frame your worldview around it being finite. Everyone is going to face death, the wise and the foolish, the righteous and the wicked. We all have the same destiny. And Bruce is going to explore that a bit more next week when he preaches. There is wisdom in how we choose to frame our thinking. If we live to only experience pleasure and avoid the hard things in life, then we are fools. If you concentrate on only pleasure, there is a danger in that. On the other hand, if you live life by only ever seeing the things in the negative, well, you miss out on seeing the good things as well. Good things that God has provided. Satisfaction in a job well done, that really good ice cream, the smell of rain that's outside at the moment. All good things and all good things that God has provided, that he's created. And it isn't as if God wants us to live miserable lives. He wants us to have joy and hope. There's the famous verse from Romans 8, chapter 28, and it says, And we know that in all good things, God works, sorry, we know that on all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. God is wanting good things for us in our lives. He isn't wanting us to be miserable. And that's a verse that we would probably frame and put on our walls because it's a good reminder for us all. But if we choose to only see the good things and not the bad, 
If we choose to only see the bad and not the good, we miss out on a full understanding of the way of the world and our place in it. In verse 14 of Ecclesiastes 7, it says, When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider this. God has made the one as well as the other. Here, the teacher seems to be encouraging a life in moderation, in balance. Some commentators, they call this the golden mean or the golden average. They draw that interpretation from verse 16 to 18. Do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over-wicked and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It's good to grasp the other to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. So is life better when it's in balance? Is this the teacher's wisdom? It really does sound a lot like common sense and something we would find in a self-help book. So after I went to the bookstore, I set myself a challenge. How many of these sorts of self-help books do I own? I went home and I started uh, looking at my bookshelves and to be honest, I was a bit surprised at how many I found. Um, I stopped grabbing them off the shelves when I'd filled up a box. Originally, I thought that I'd come and bring some and show them off, but it was getting a bit too heavy for me. Um, Yeah, I found I had a collection of both Christian and non-Christian self-help wisdomy books. And all of them were helpful in their own way, but some were definitely less so. But the ones that are ultimately the most helpful were the ones that were pointing to God, that had that perspective a life beyond under the sun. One of the books was from C.S. Lewis, and here's someone who said that he believes in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Because by it, I see everything else. As Christians, our perspective of life changes. We view the world always in the perspective of God, or at least we attempt to. And that's the big difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom, unsurprisingly. Worldly wisdom encourages self-help, independence, I can save myself sort of attitude. And there is a time and a place for those things. But biblical wisdom is pointing you back to God, pointing to our dependence on him. An essential part of our Christian journeys is when we acknowledge our own limitations and understandings of the world. And the teacher mentions this in verse 23 and 24 as he reflects on his quest to find wisdom. It was beyond him. Who can discover it, he asks. Then over in chapter 8, he continues, When I applied my my mind to know wisdom and to observe the labour that is done on earth, people getting no sleep day or night, then I saw all that God has done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can discover its meaning. Even if the wise claim to know, they cannot really comprehend it. True wisdom, it comes from God. Even if we think we're wise and have life all together, we might find out in the end that we're actually fooling ourselves. If we don't have God but lean on our own understanding or our own wisdom, where does that get us? In the Bible, God is the source of wisdom. This is what Christians believe. And that's what's concluded in Job 28. There's a very famous poem about where wisdom is found. And that's one of the big questions of today. Can humans find it on their own? Job writes this, God understands the way to it, and he alone knows where it dwells. For he views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. 
when he established the force of the wind and measured out the waters, when he made a decree for the rain and a path for the thunderstorm. Then he looked at wisdom and appraised it. He confirmed it and tested it. And he said to the human race, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. It is only God who knows where wisdom dwells. That's the conclusion, that wisdom is to fear God and to shun evil, means that you've understood it. And the teacher in Ecclesiastes comes to a similar conclusion. The fear of the Lord is wisdom. We see it throughout the Bible. Uh, It doesn't mean fear like we think it does. It means to revere God, respect him, and stand in awe of him, to live a life according to him. That is wisdom. And to understand wisdom is to apply it. It's practical. To shun evil is to show that you've understood it. In the parable of the Good Samaritan that was read to us earlier, we have an example of three men who would have been the highly educated and the wise men of Jewish society, a priest, a judge, and a teacher of the law. These are people who studied God's word, people who should have understood what God valued, but they were so wrapped up in their self-centered self-righteousness, they deliberately walked past a man who was dying. Here we have an example of the dangers of being overly self-righteous. And the teacher in Ecclesiastes is warning against that as well. These three men were so concerned by their state of righteousness, they missed a basic thing, to love your neighbor, to help those who are in need. They were blinded by their sense of self-righteousness to true godly wisdom. And in the end, they became wicked, but they thought they had it all together. Yet they were not depending on God and seeing the world from his perspective, but they thought they were. Can you see the danger there? A danger that we as Christians also fall into? Christians, we have a pretty bad reputation when it comes to hypocrisy. The holier than you, I'm better than you so I can judge you, which is rubbish really. No one is truly righteous on their own. No one is without sin. It's here in Ecclesiastes and it's throughout the Bible. No one can self-help themselves. No one can save themselves. We are utterly dependent on God. So when we act self-righteously in pride, we end up doing more damage because people can see the hypocrisy. We become like the Pharisees as we lord our own impressiveness over others. We shouldn't be pointing to ourselves and our own merits and wisdom. We should be humbly pointing to God, to always going back to him, to make sure that we aren't leaning on our own wisdom. Otherwise, we might miss things. We might do more harm than good. Don't be afraid to look beyond yourself and towards God. Search your heart and find that reality within. Do we avoid taking an honest look at ourselves like we avoid thinking about death? Is it too confronting? We probably won't like what we see, but if we avoid it, if we hide from it, we find ourselves in danger. Funerals, they have a way of forcing us to really consider life. If we ignore the reality of death, the teacher in Ecclesiastes would say we are fools. If we avoid the darkest realities of our hearts and our minds, perhaps we also become fools. Because it's there where God needs to be at work. If true wisdom is to fear God and shun evil, It's pretty hard to shun evil if we're doing our best to avoid the darkness within ourselves. And it's here where the reminder to look at the good things also becomes very timely because we're not just awful sinners full of darkness, but people made in the loving image of God, people who God so loved that he gave his only son. We need to both see with sober judgment 
the good and the bad things of ourselves and then turn towards God and live life from his perspective. Greg's advice at the beginning of this sermon series was that we need to be willing to sit with our uncomfortable questions, to not shy away from it, and to sit with that tension. And that's where we find ourselves again today. And this tension is not a bad thing. And today I'm going to end this sermon with a series of questions that may make you feel uncomfortable. They make me feel uncomfortable. What sort of wisdom are we filling our heads with? Are we telling ourselves that we can help ourselves? That the answer to everything was inside us all along? Are we self-helping ourselves and forgetting that it's God that we need? Are we listening to wisdom that points us to God or to ourselves? It may be uncomfortable, but it's good to sit with that tension and with the answers and then cast our minds, look to the heavens and thank God for all he's done. Our final uh, song for this morning is a classic hymn and uh, like many hymns, it's a prayer. And as we uh, listen to this, you might want to make it your prayer. Be thou my vision, be thou my wisdom. Listen now.
And the Apostle Paul writes, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let's dedicate ourselves to the service of our God and Father in this dedication prayer. Father, take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of your Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, thanks for joining with us uh, online or here in person. We hope you'll join us again next week. And next week, living dogs beat dead lions from Ecclesiastes chapter 9.